Okay, welcome everybody. This is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman. And uh, here in this video, we're going to be talking about this topic called pawn levers. And uh, in the pawn lever topic, basically what a pawn lever is, is kind of the same as a pawn breakthrough. You push a pawn in order to either make your opponent a concession or you make an improvement somehow in your own position one way or another. So first we're going to take a look at a few examples more closer to the opening. And here in this game I'm black against another GM slightly lower rated than me. And in this game the GM played like this, f3. And now basically a pawn lever is a move f5, challenging another pawn like this with the idea to try to basically disturb opponent's pawn chain. And uh, it's sort of like a breakthrough. And um, here after f5, the idea is, if I did not play f5, if I played a move like knight f6, then after bishop d3, knight e2, castles, white would just consolidate with a very nice position. And uh, he would have a lot of control in the center. But my idea here is to play f5, to sacrifice a pawn, with the idea after e takes f5, to play the move knight h6. That's the key idea. And after knight h6, the idea would be if bishop takes h6, queen h4, g3, queen takes h6, and I have a lot of compensation because of white's weak king and I have a two bishop advantage, and also being ahead in development. And uh, if he goes f takes e6, I'm gonna go knight f5, sacrificing another pawn, but creating some deadly threats. So my opponent played bishop e3, but this is already a concession because now I was able to get the pawn back in a good way where I activate my knight, I gain another tempo, and now my idea is I want to go bishop e4 and uh, get a lot of initiative basically. So I played bishop e4, my opponent played knight c3, I played castles, queen b3, and now bishop back to e7. Castles long, bishop h4, so I want to trade off the defender of the dark squares. Queen c2, queen g5, king b1, bishop takes f2, queen takes f2, and now knight e3. So my opponent played queen d2, pinning my knight to the queen. I played knight a6, developing the last piece. My opponent played rook e1. If he tried knight h3, I would have played queen g6, bishop d3, queen takes g2. Queen takes e3, queen takes h3, and now I'm up a pawn with a good position. So therefore my opponent tried rook e1, I gave this check, king c1, once again if bishop d3 I would have taken on g2, so king c1, knight takes f1, rook takes f1, and now here's another pawn lever. So idea is I want to try to open up lines because his king is weak, and I want to try to attack the king now. My opponent took, and now I took back knight 65, but I could have also played a move like rook a c8 with the idea of c b a b, b3 trying to defend the pawn, and now after d5, chipping away once again, trying to make a breakthrough pawn lever. If king b2 takes, I have a very good position, whereas cd is just simply unplayable because of rook takes c3, queen takes c3, and rook c8, and I'm much better. So, in the game, I played knight takes c5 simply, my opponent played rook d1, and I played d5. So once again, the idea is trying to attack the king, and trying to open up the c-file. So this is a good example basically on what a pawn lever could do. So, first of all, it the purpose of a pawn lever is to try to get rid of opponent's space advantage. And second of all, it's a good way to try to open up the game to try to attack the king. And we'll see these examples more in the next few examples. So my opponent played b4, which is already a, an inaccuracy. If he played cd, then I would have played bishop h6, knight h3, let's say, knight d3, king b1, knight f2, king a1 takes, takes, and now the idea is he's down in exchange, but he could still fight. But b4 was maybe a little bit too weakening already. Knight a6, b5, knight c5, cd, bishop takes d5. Now, of course, taking the bishop would be deadly because I would just have an open file and he would not even have a knight to protect. So white played knight h3, 
And now here I missed the win. So if you want to try to find it, you can pause your videos. So if you need more time, keep your videos paused. So I played rook c8, after which I'm still better and later on I won the game. But the best move would have been bishop b3. And uh, after bishop b3, the idea is if he goes rook df1, rook d8, queen e2, I have just a big attack. Whereas, of course, the main idea is after a b, I go knight takes b3 and I attack the queen. So as you could see, here I made several pawn levers. Two of them were to open up the king and another one was also to open up the king but also to make my bishop more active and get rid of his very strong pawn chain. In this game I'm black against a much lower rated but that's not the point. The point is that to show you an example of a pawn lever and uh, we're gonna skip through the opening relatively quickly. And in this game I played bishop g4 to fight for the d4 square so possibly his whole strategy was not ideal. And now my opponent played knight e2 which is a little bit of an inaccurate. And now once again when you decide on the plan you have to realize where is his strong area, where is his space advantage and see if you can try to chip away in it. So in this position it's black to play and find the best move. So what do you guys think black should do here in this position? So if you need more time, keep your videos paused. The best move here is b5. Because the idea is I want to open up the a file, maybe the b file, if he lets me take. And also I'm attacking the pawn on c4, which can only be defended with the pawn on d3. And that means the e4 pawn also becomes weak. So, and why I play b5 is because I want him to capture, so that I can capture towards the center and I get rid of his central control and control over the space. And uh, also, it's very hard for me to really do d5 ever because he has two pawns controlling it. And also e5 is very difficult because my bishop then becomes bad. So therefore, b5 is quite strong in this position. So after it takes, takes, very quickly I just got a dominant position because now all my pieces are active, my bishop is dominant. And uh, I also have control over the center and... He was almost forced to put his pieces into awkward squares. And very soon I won the game because he had to sacrifice the queen and the rest was pretty easy from here. In this game, a uh, game between Ginkgo and uh, Stockfish, this is a game between two very strong computers, but Stockfish a tad stronger. Stockfish is played in the super finals and the computer super final. And here we have d4, knight f6. And uh, we'll get a sort of a Queen's Indian. And the black strategy is basically to fight for this e4 square. And uh, we get quickly to this position. And now white has an idea. He wants to play knight d4 and uh, improve his position. So in this position black to play, what to do? So a logical move here would have been to play e5. But then the problem is this bishop kind of becomes bad. And after g3. Let's say knight df6, knight h4, g6, f3. This knight will be kicked away. And at some point, if he wants to activate the bishop, black's gonna have to play c6. But then after pawn takes rook d1, the d6 pawn will be weak. So black does not really want to play a position like this. So therefore, after d5, black plays another idea. He does not want to let the white knight get active. But at the same time, he does not want white to get too much control over the center. And uh, he plays c5. And the idea of c5 is a, it's a pawn lever. It, the idea is it's like a breakthrough move. And kind of forces white to make action. Because if he wants to d4 square, he has to relieve the tension. And after this, black will be doing quite well. Because he has control over the c file. And uh, control over the center. And white does not have that much play. Whereas if he doesn't take on Poisson, he can't ever do it again, and then he has to surrender the d4 square. So whenever you play a move like this, it basically, oftentimes it's a good idea because it forces your opponent into a couple of bad options, and uh, that's very often a good idea to do. When you put tension in the center, and you force your opponent already to make a somewhat of a concession. So in the game, rook fd1 was played, but after queen e7, g3, rook c8, 
Black already got a comfortable game because soon he's gonna take, play knight f6, g5, and he has a free attack, whereas white does not seem to have a lot of play. Black later on won this game. This game shows an example how pawn lever can also help when your back is against the wall. So in this game I'm playing strong grandmaster Sam Shankland in the US Championship, and my opponent played an ambitious opening line against my Nimzo Indian. He played f3, trying to play e4, trying to get control over the center. And uh, I played c5, challenging the center, d5, castles, e4, d6, knight e2. I played not the best way, so we do not have to go through it very deeply. But the point is that very quickly he got a very nice position right here. Because the point is that all he needs to do is go queen c2, bishop b2, rook a1, get his pieces into the game, and suddenly, very soon, he'll just steamroll over me with ideas like knight c4, e5, and if I make a couple of more slow moves, I'm just gonna die without a fight. So what to do in such a situation? Where, well, one of the problems here is we have a bad bishop on b6, and we need to activate it. So in this case, it's good to even give up a pawn to activate the bishop, because otherwise we have absolutely no counterplay. So in this position, I play the move c4, which is really my only chance. And now, suddenly it's not as clear. Bishop takes c4 is probably not good at all, because after knight g4, I'm threatening knight e3, knight f2, and if he tries to defend with queen e2, I can already do this, followed by queen h4. So this is already good for black. My opponent played b takes c4. Best move would have been knight takes c4, but that was not an easy move to play because that would give back the central pawn. But objectively speaking, this would have kept a white with a slightly better position because after takes takes, he can play something like queen c2, rook e8, bishop b2, and he just has a free hand. He has more active pieces and he has a little bit of an initiative, and this would have been an unpleasant way position to play. But still, at least the material is equal, and at least he does not have both pawns in the center, and at least I'm still fighting here. But my opponent got greedy, he took on b takes c4. And now suddenly I have control over the dark squares, I was able to activate my bishop, and also I opened up in the future a good square for my knight, which earlier on had basically no prospects. So in this case, the pawn lever was just to minimize the damage of my position and to at least get some play, and to basically activate my piece. So it's a pawn sacrifice. I played bishop e3, and my opponent should have again played e5. And after takes, f takes, knight takes, knight e4. Eventually it's a complicated line, but white ends up being a little bit better. But my opponent played f5, but now look at these beautiful squares. I control all of these dark squares, and suddenly he has no more attack. All he has is a measly pawn, which he did consult it, but suddenly look at all the play that I got. And after knight b3, bishop takes, queen takes, knight e d7. Again, he maybe should have tried c5 with the idea to give up the pawn but get some activity. But instead, after bishop f3, queen c7, a5, knight c5, black already gets a pretty comfortable game, very good compensation for the pawn. And even the computer says it's roughly equal. And uh, as you can see, this bishop on f3 is just not that good anymore. And in general, white's pieces are, aren't doing very much. And in chess, in general, something that's most important is the piece activity. And when I do videos on piece activity, misplaced pieces and uh, statically and dynamically misplaced pieces will learn much more about this topic. So in this position, position is roughly equal, and later on the game had much more adventures, but after all was said and done, the game ended up becoming a draw. And at some point it looked like I might just go down without a fight. But that's why very often it's important to keep in mind the idea of pawn levers, sometimes to even sacrificing a pawn for it. In this example, this is a relatively straightforward example, how a pawn lever could just be simple with the idea of opening up the king and taking advantage of a hook. And again, we're gonna quickly go through the opening here, and uh, h3, and now black played a very strange move. A human would probably not play the move, but the computer probably did not sense the danger of what might happen to him in the long run, which typically happens for computers which are not as strong. So knight f6 would have been the best move with a normal game, 
but Violet played h6, and after g4, suddenly White just gets a very nice attack going on. Just simply the idea it's a pawn breakthrough to try to open up the g file, which will be crucial to attack the king. After h5, the idea would be, of course, to play knight h4, and he cannot even play g6 because of this pin. So, therefore, after hg, bishop to hg5, queen b6, king e2, suddenly white wants to go queen f1, queen g2, and he, of course, does not want to castle because he wants to control the g file. So, after d5, queen g1, rook e8, queen g3. As you could see, white's attack is just very becoming very strong, even though black got control over the center, but still, white attack is too strong. And now black played a move like rook a8, which is a little bit strange, of course, but at this point, probably it's already too late. And shortly after that, white won a nice game with another very nice breakthrough move, f4, takes, king d1, getting out of any possible pins, but basically white breaks through very quickly, just like this. The next game I want to show you is a nice positional concept, again, by a very strong computer, Houdini, with white against Critter, and we get a King's Indian, and black played bishop g4, and now white played this idea knight g1 to try to exchange bishops, and also put the knight on e2 where it controls the d4 square. White kills black's possible counterplay here. And now little by little, white just kills all of black's counterplay and little by little improves his position. Until finally we get to this critical moment. Now interestingly enough, this looks like it's a bad decision for white taking on f6. Because now it looks like black has complete control over the e5 square. And it seems like white has no progress. But after a few more maneuvers, white found a very nice idea here. And uh, it's white to play and... Uh, get a decisive advantage. And of course, I already showed here, the idea is pawn lever. Now, if we play f5 first, it would not be nearly as effective because after g5, black gets control over the e5 square and this knight remains out of play, as does knight. So the idea here is to play e5 to open up the key square e4 for our knight and also to take away a square from his knight. So basically, in order to activate our own piece and make his pieces bad, we're sacrificing a pawn, and also we're able to open up lines. So now if d takes e5, f takes e5, our idea is to go knight e4, knight takes f6. So therefore f takes e5 is forced, and but now f5, white opens up the game, and look at black's bad pieces, knight on g7, the knight on d7 has no room to go, and I, white actually breaks through in a very nice way. So rook g8 takes takes, knight e4, and now white basically wins because this knight on g7 was going to be very bad. And uh, white has a lot of initiative. Black had to give up the pawn because otherwise knight e4 was threatened, followed by some knight of 7 ideas. As well as queen of 2 was in there, attacking the knight. So black played e4, rook f4, queen e5, takes, takes. And uh, because of this bad knight for black, White shortly won, and also he has a very active piece, a very active rook, and this is a decisive factor, and uh, shortly after that, White won very nicely. So as you could see, sometimes you can also sacrifice a pawn, make a pawn breakthrough with the idea to make your other pawn breakthrough even stronger, and sometimes you can give up a pawn to take away a square from your opponent, and also from your opponent's piece, as well as giving your own piece some more active avenues. And finally, I want to show you a game, once again, by Houdini, this time Houdini is black, against Gaul. And here, now they're out of theory because only the first two moves are book moves in this tournament. Now black played bishop g4, white played d5. d takes c5 was also interesting, after which black play a nice move bishop g7, threatening knight takes c4, with a very interesting play. So therefore, white played d5. Black played knight d4, bishop e2, bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, bishop g7, castles, and now b5. So little by little, black improves his position. 
rook f8 defending the knight. And now he wants to go rook b8 because he realizes the rook does not really do anything on d8. And now we get a critical position. And here it looks like white's doing very well because white wants to go bishop b5, bishop c4, and then f4, e5. And it looks like where's black's play? So once again, we're up against the wall and we're, it looks like we're suffocating. And it looks like how do we make the most out of our pieces? The knight on d7 looks like it's passive. It looks like it has very little prospects. And in general, what exactly we're supposed to do here. So that's why you have to always consider pawn sacrifices, pawn levers, pawn breakthroughs. What can that give us? And in this position, a very strong move for black is c4. Well, of course, if white takes first, then black would take, and the pawn on c4 would be protected, and then he would get the pawn back with rook c8. But of course, what happens after bishop takes c4? It looks like now the bishop could just move away, and looks like we just gave up a pawn. But the thing is, the fact that we gave up this pawn means nothing because we have two pawns controlling these three. And uh, the pawn on c2 is very weak. And now black has a very strong open c file. This rook on b2 is going to be forever passive because it's going to be tied down to white's position. And also this knight now got a lot of active squares. And all these factors combined means that the pawn sacrifice was very good, very sound. And black actually won a very nice game from here on. Now black repossessions his knight, improves his position to the maximum. Notice how he puts all his pawns on the color of opposite to white's bishop. And now eventually, if you want to win the game, you have to make a second breakthrough and you have to try to create a second weakness. So in this position, how do we do that? How do we create a second weakness? So if you need one more time, keep your videos paused. And again, once again, it's another pawn lever, g4, in order to open up the g file. Takes rook g8, king e2, and now black broke through. And now soon the king will penetrate. And now finally the last breakthrough to activate the king. And then, as you'll see, all of these pawns will become weak. And uh, white tried to fight, but this position is already defenseless because these pawns, as well as these active rooks, while white has a passive rook, means that this position is undefensible. And very soon black won the game. So as we could see, pawn levers are first of all to try to fight against the opponent's center, opponent's space. It can also be to try to open up lines, files to try to attack the king or in general just pressure an opponent's weakness. And uh, also a pawn breakthrough could be to try to take away opponent's squares as well as opening up new squares for yourself. And it can also be to activate your piece and uh, like I did against Sam Shanklin. So as you could see, Pawn breakthroughs can be very often created in a lot of different ways. And in fact, very often it can be even be a pawn sacrifice. A very interesting positional pawn sacrifice. So I hope you enjoyed this video on pawn levers. This is more like an introduction to pawn levers. And in the next video, we're going to be covering also the topic of pawn lever. But we're going to be talking about more of examples of prophylaxis. How a pawn lever will prevent our opponent from creating any kind of pawn levers. So I hope you enjoyed this video and until next time, this is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman signing off.